halfing all day and I'm halfing all night. I'm halfing to the beat and I half it up tight. I half in the morning and I half till I'm done. And everybody knows that I'm number 0.5 cause I'm halfing, I'm halfing, I'm half, half, halfing. I'm halfing, I'm halfing, I'm halfing till you half it. I'm halfing, I'm halfing, I'm half, half, halfing. I'm half, 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 halfing. Halfing all day and I'm halfing all night. That's right, today we're talking about Half-Life. Hit the theme. Ain't nothing but a chem thing, baby. Too flipped out, teachers going crazy. Lancaster is a district that pays me. Unbreakable, so please don't try to break this. But uh, back to the lecture at hand. Hello and welcome to another episode of Shu Fu coming at ya. I'm your host Shu, and with me as always is Fu. What up, nerds? So Fu, in the last video, we talked about radioactive decay and we talked about how unstable nuclei break down. Yeah, and in today's episode, we're gonna talk about the mathematical side of nuclear decay. So let's get started. Half-life, a lesson from the nuclear chemistry unit. The concept of half-life, what is it? It's the amount of time it takes for half of a sample's nuclei to decay. This amount of time, regardless of the initial amount, remains constant. It is important to note that during one half-life, half of an atom's nucleus doesn't decay, but instead, the nuclei of half the atoms in a given sample decay. Wait, what? No matter how many atoms you start with, half of them will decay after one half-life. After a second half-life, half of the atoms that remain after the first decay will also decay, and so on. The time that passes after each decay by half does not change. Although from a mathematical standpoint, you wouldn't expect to ever reach zero, in reality, all atoms will eventually decay and you will reach zero. So if we take a look at the image on the left, we have a graph that helps illustrate this concept. On the y-axis of our graph, we can see it's the percentage of radioisotopes that remain. And on the x-axis, we have the number of half-lives it goes through. So our percentage always starts at 100%. So we have 100 red atoms as illustrated above the graph. Now, after one half-life, we would expect that half of the radioactive elements would decay into what we can call daughter isotopes. So the red radioactive ones represent the parent isotope. They become the daughter isotopes. So now we would go from 100% to 50%. After another half-life, so now we're after a second half-life, we had 50% remaining, we would now cut that in half. So now we would have 25% remaining. Another half-life would cut the 25 down to 12.5, another down to 6.25, and so on. How do half-lives differ? Use table N to look up the half-life for each nuclei. Each radioisotope has its own distinct half-life that cannot be changed. What else should I know about half-life? Radioisotopes with short half-lives are less dangerous because they decay more quickly. Radioisotopes with long half-lives are more dangerous because they decay slowly and thus stay radioactive longer. This is a particular problem with radioactive waste. Changes in temperature, pressure, concentration, surface area, and catalyst do not affect the decay rate and thus do not affect the half-life. All right, we're gonna take a look at the half-life of carbon-14. So if I have a sample of carbon-14 that's shown by the red atoms, and I start at time zero right about now, they're gonna start decaying into nitrogen 14 that's shown by the blue atoms. After one half-life, I've gone from 100% carbon 14 to 50%, and I've gone from 0% nitrogen 14 to 50%. One half-life in this case equals a little over 5,000 years. Half-life calculations. You will use table N and a time chart to solve half-life calculations. Use table N to determine the half-life if the identity of the nuclide is given in the problem. A time chart involves the time, zero for the initial time, and the mass remaining. All right, we're gonna do some examples showing half-life calculations. You ready, Fu? I am. Good. How many grams remain of a 10.0 gram sample of cobalt-60 after 15.813 years? All right, let's start by making our time chart. So T, zero, M. Good, make a little grid there. Got it. All right, let's break down what 
Tom mean? So what's T in Tom stand for? T stands for time. Now looking at the problem, what unit of time will we be using? It looks like years. Good, let's note that in our Tom chart so we don't forget. Okay. Now what's the O in Tom stand for? Uh, o is a zero, uh, it stands for time equal to zero. Good, so that means we have zero years at the beginning. We always wanna start with that zero time. Okay. What's the M in Tom stand for? M stands for mass. Good, and according to this question, what unit of mass will we be using? Looks like a 10 gram sample. All right, so let's note grams next to the M. Okay. All right, the next thing we wanna do is use table N to find the half-life. Uh, but what, what radioisotope are we talking about in this question? Uh, this one says a sample of cobalt-60. Good, let's find that on table N. All right, so cobalt-60, I see it's towards the top. It's this one right here. Good, and we want to note what its half-life is. Right, so half-life is that second column. It looks like 5.271 years. Very good. That's going to be very important to constructing our Tom chart correctly. All right, so we're starting at time zero, and we're going to undergo one half-life. So we're going to draw an arrow to the next box and write a one over it. That's going to represent one half-life occurring. Okay. Now, based on what you just determined, how much time has passed after one half-life? 5.271 years. Good, let's put that in under time. Good, so one half-life has occurred. We've got 5.271 years occurring. Okay. All right, let's do another half-life with our arrow. Okay. Now, how much time would have passed now? Um, well, if every half-life is 5.271 years, I would add another 5.271 years to it. Exactly, good. Okay, so that looks like 10.542 years. Good, let's do another half-life. Okay, let's go third half-life and adding another 5.271 years, right? Yep. Uh, looks like 15.813 years. Now, we actually know that we can stop here and not just keep going forever because if you look at the problem, it says uh, after 15.813 years. Okay. So can you kind of see where our final answer is gonna be? Okay, so if I want the mass remaining, that's gonna be how much is right down here at the end of that 15.813 years. Exactly, okay. good. So let's work out the mass. Uh, what is our beginning mass at time zero? All right, so it says in the problem that it was a 10 gram sample to begin with, and beginning is always time zero, so 10.0 grams. All right, so we're going to do the same sort of thing where we have a half-life occurring. What do we want to do to the mass with every half-life? Cut it in half. Exactly. I mean, it sort of tells you right in the name what to do. Okay. So how many grams would we have after one half-life? 5.00 grams. Great, let's keep going. Uh, half of that is 2.50 grams. And finally? Uh, looks like 1.25 grams. Great, that is our final answer. We have 1.25 grams remaining after 15.813 years. Good job. All right. All right, we're gonna do another example. Are you still ready, Fu? We're talking about practice. I am. All right, so what fraction remains of a radioisotope that undergoes four half-lives? All right, let's start with our Tom chart. Okay. Got it. All right, now what unit is time gonna be in here? Uh, it doesn't say a time. Doesn't really give a normal unit of time, but it does give us the number of half-lives, so we can measure time in number of half-lives. So let's okay. note that by T. All right, what about the mass? Uh, it doesn't give me that either. Doesn't give you that either. But it does say what fraction, and that would be a fraction of the mass, even though they don't actually give us a unit of mass. So let's note that the mass will be in terms of a fraction. Got it. All right. So it does say in the question how many half-lives have uh, gone by, and how many is that? It says four half-lives. All right. So let's put that into our chart. Okay. So... Well, I know that arrows represent half-lives and I put the numbers over the arrows, but I'm just gonna carry that number over to the next box too. That Looks good. Kinda makes sense. So after one, there's second half-life, 
this one's almost like I'm half an all day and I'm half an all night here. All right, I got Indeed four half does. lives. All right, beautiful. All right, so fraction. Um, hmm, fraction. What are we going to start with at time zero? Well, the initial time is the whole substance, right? Yeah. So the fraction that means a whole is one? Just one, exactly. Okay. Now, we're going to just be halving that, okay? It's like when you're in elementary school and you're just like cutting the pie in half, right? So okay. let's cut one in half after one half life. Oh, well, half of one is one half. Good. Now we have to take half of one half. Remember, we're really just doubling the denominator when we half a fraction. Okay, so then that's one fourth. Good. And then one eighth. Yep. And it looks like one sixteenth. Good, let's circle that as our final answer because after four half lives, one sixteenth of the original sample will remain. Okay, easy enough. All right, we have yet another example. Are you ready again, Fu? Talk about practice? Talk about practice? We're not talking about the test. Talk about practice? I guess I'm ready. A sample of an isotope decays from 100 grams to 12.5 grams in 30.0 days. What is the half life of the unknown radioisotope? This question's a little bit different, but we know we can start with our time chart. All right, so I'll set that up. All right, so what unit of time are we using in this question? Um, it says 30 days here. That's the only unit of time I see. Sounds good. Let's note that in our time chart. What about the mass? Uh, mass says grams, 100 grams to 12.5 grams. So got that. All right, so what is the half-life of our isotope? Uh, that's what we're solving for. Good, it was a trick question. We're hmm. trying to find the half-life. They're not giving us something we can look up on table N. Okay. So we don't know the half-life. That's gonna kind of make the time row a little bit more difficult to fill in, right? Okay. So we do know that we're going from 100 grams to 12.5 grams. So why don't we use the mass then to figure out something about the number of half-lives in time? Okay. So it's a versatile kind of chart. You know, We don't just have to use time to find the mass could use mass to find time as well. Perfect, all right. So it uh, looks like I start at 100 grams, so at time equal to zero, I have 100 grams. Good. Um, I'm just gonna continue on, I guess. One half life, 100 will become 50. Good, we're cutting in half. Again, we don't really know what the time is, we just know that one half life has occurred, so you're, you're filling in exactly right. Okay, after another half life, that becomes 25 uh, grams. And well, I gotta get 12.5, that's one more. So that's 12.5 grams. Good, we know we can stop because we went from 100 grams to 12.5 grams. Now, how many half-lives was that? Uh, well, they're my arrow, so three of them. Three of them, good. Now, how long did those three half-lives take? Oh, it's in the problem. Exactly. 30 days. All right, we can at least put that time in after three half-lives. We don't really have to fill in the other times, as long as we know that three half-lives took 30 days. Okay. So mathematically, kind of off to the side, how could we find the time for a single half-life? Well, if it was 30 total days and you went through three half-lives, you just divide, right? 30 days divided by three half-lives? Exactly, let's show that work. Okay, so half-life is equal to total time. divided by half-lives. And that's just the 30 over three. Uh, 10 days? Good, let's do sig figs though. Looks like we've got three sig mm -hmm. figs for all of our numbers. Yeah, looks like three on all of them, so 10.0 days. Perfect. All right, we have yet another example again. Are you really still ready, Fu? Talking about practice? Man, we still talking about practice? We're not talking about the test. Man, we're talking about practice. I guess I'm ready. All right, given a sample of SR90, 
How long will it take to decay such that only 6.25% of strontium-90 remains? All right, let's start with our Tom chart. Okay, two, zero, M. All right, what is our time going to be in? Let's see, it looks like, uh, looks like I have no idea, because it doesn't say. It doesn't say, okay, so we'll leave that open for now. Okay. What about mass? Uh, it doesn't give me a mass either. It does have a percentage though. All right, so it could be percent of the mass, right? Okay, so, so it can be mass, fraction, or percentage? Yeah, exactly. Okay. So we have sort of flexibility in this chart. The units can be different. So percent is still good for mass. All, All right. right, we do have a nuclide here, so we can look up its half-life on table N. Okay, it looks like strontium 90. So uh, looking, looks like it's towards the bottom here. I see strontium-90 right here, and 29.1 years is its half-life. All right, great. So we can first of all note the unit for time now that we know it. Okay, so it was in years, so years. And we can also put the time for one half-life into our chart. Okay, that makes sense. After one half-life, it's 29.1 years. Awesome. Now, what are we trying to find in this question? It says... How long will it take? So how long, that's time. Right, so this is gonna be a question where we're gonna use the mass to find the time again. So we're okay. not gonna keep filling out time right now, even though we did look up and fill in the half-life. Okay. We wanna actually look at percentage to get to 6.25%, and that's gonna help us figure out the total time. Okay. All right, so if we're looking at percents, what's gonna be our percent of the sample at time zero? 100%. Exactly, we have all of it. And after one half-life, what percent will remain? Uh, that would be 50%. All right, looks like we have to keep going here. So let's do another half-life. Okay, so 25.0%. Let's, let's also fill in the arrow with the two up top okay, so we remember that idea. we have two half-lives going on. Okay. All right, looks like we have to continue. All right, so a third half-life gets me to 12.5%. We're getting closer. And it looks like after a fourth half-life, if I'm doing my math correctly here, it should be 6.25%. Good, we know to stop now because we got to the 6.25% that's described in the question. Okay. All right, we gotta fill in the rest of our row of time so that we can figure out how much time has passed by the time we get to the 6.25%. Okay, so well, each half-life is 29.1, so I'm just gonna add that to each half-life, right? So yep. after a second half-life, that's 58.2 years. Okay. Uh, adding another 29.1, I get 87.3 years. And another 29.1, I get 116.4 years. Good, so it looks like it took 116.4 years to get to 6.25%, so let's circle that time as our final answer. Okay. Good job. You try. What mass of iodine-131 remains 32.084 days after a 100 gram sample of the isotope is obtained? Make sure to use your time chart. Well, that's gonna do it for today's episode on Half-Life. Later, nerds! Today's episode is brought to you by Welter's Fisheye Wearable Fish Camera. Let a fish do your fishing. Bonus, fish scented lens cleaner included. Wolf Weekly says, carp a diem. Not intended for aquarium fish. One time use only, not disposable. Results may vary. But we never off, but we zone to the brick of dawn. A C I E N C E in the hall, they call S Wing. You know we never wear a tie. Like my homies, boys, two men, it's so hard to say goodbye. Like this, that, and this, and uh, it's like that, and like this, and like that, and uh, it's like this. You're going in low power mode. Plug in chill to the next episode.